um, Piper is. And if you if you never heard of John Piper, John Piper is a, is a pastor, and, and he's got a website called Desiring God. And it's one of the um, websites that I look at reading so I mean you're welcome to go look at his stuff. But perfunctory prayer signifies a perfunctory relationship with God. What that word means is a hurry, quick, cursory, short, brief type prayer. Now I know, you know, I mean, and I and I don't I don't, I don't mean to step on people's toes, but I probably will step on toes by saying this. So I'm I'm saying this as a nice and as a brother in Christ. But I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I do my prayer time in the, in, the car, in the car. And don't shake your hand, don't raise your hand, don't, don't shake your hand, oh, no, no, it's not me, or whatever. You know, I'm a big advocate in prayer. I'm learning to continue to pray. You know, Paul, as we've been studying through Paul's letters, Paul, you know, he's, he said in Philippians, he said, pray without ceasing. What does that really mean, to pray without ceasing? And a lot of times, you know, I mean, a lot of people will, you know, will pin you down and say, well, you got to get up every morning and do your devotions and every prayer time. When did Jesus pray? When you read scripture, where, when did Jesus pray? He was alone. He was alone when? A lot of times. At night. At night. Think about it. During the day, he was doing God's work. At night, he was communing with God. So sometimes, and, 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 and there's not a recipe on when to pray, where you do it in the morning. I'm a person that loves to get up in the morning, and I do, and I do my devotions at prayer time in the morning. But, you know, there's not a recipe that, oh, you got to do it at such such day and time. You know, I, I mean, I'm not trying to tear down the Islamics, but I mean, they go and they pray seven times in certain directions, during certain monuments and then something else. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a ritual. And we're going, to be, we're going to be looking here at Matthew 6. And we're going to look at several prayers tonight. But um, I'm, I'm a big advocate also of just, and I want to share one of them, a big advocate of looking at prayers of people in the Bible and trying to understand what they were praying about and how they prayed to help me grow in my relationship about prayer. So we're going to look at six different prayers um, tonight. But the first prayer I want to... Um, really start with is the one that we probably all know if you've ever attended a Methodist church, and again, I'm not trying to announce Methodist, uh, Methodism because um, anybody know where Methodists came from? Anybody know anything about Methodism? John, John Wesley. Okay, John Wesley, but he wasn't a pastor for the Methodist church. He was a pastor for the Church of England. He started a Bible study which was a method on how to study the Bible. And so, and so when you look at Methodists, I mean, when John, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is a rabbit, sometimes I do rabbits, <laughs> but, um, but when you, when you look, when you look at John um, Wesley's ministry, he came over here Jehovah's to, you know, again, the Church of England, witness. huh? Mm -hmm. That's the Jehovah's Witness, is God right there. Mm -hmm. What's that? John Wesley? No, not the, not, not Jehovah's Witness mm -hmm. that I know of. Yeah, they preach on here a lot. Do they? Okay, I'm, I've never been a part of the Jehovah's Witness, but John Wesley was, um, um, and I, I hope they don't mistake what he was doing, but he was a big advocate of Christ only and our lives to be sanctified in Christ, which means to continue to grow in Christ. So again, I don't know exactly um, about the... Um, Maybe you never have one come to you. No, I haven't. I need to. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but, but, <laughs> I, 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 I really do. But I mean, but, but and I'm not a big proponent. I mean, I'm not a big proponent of just one single person either. But I do. But but um, in John Wesley's method, he was a method on learning how to study the Bible. And what happened is, like anything else, people turn something into religion because, again, looking at the America, America wanted to get away from England, so they didn't want nothing to do with the Church of England. So therefore. Methodists started to have these what they call circuit riders that would go around to different small churches and um, and you know and minister to those different small churches. But anyway, that's enough on that rabbit. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad. And that's Jehovah. What did you say for John Wesley? I have to look that up. Yeah, I, that's the first I ever heard that. To be honest with you. Okay, but um, I want us to t first turn to Matthew six five through thirteen. Like I said, we're going to look at several different prayers. But this one, I think, is the most common. And, and, and the one that I think a lot of times gets totally misunderstood. 
It's called the model prayer. But if you go into some churches, and that's why I got went down the road with Methodists, if you go, you know, like I grew up in a Methodist, when I first became a Christian, I started going to Methodist church, and we would always say this every single service. We would recite the Lord's Prayer, and it almost became repetitious. And if you really, if you, it, in it, Matthew 6. And if you really look at the prayer and what Jesus was teaching, because this is a Sermon on the Mount, if you really look at it, he was trying to teach people not to be repetitious. Right. But what he was doing is he is, is he was trying to teach because the disciples were going, well, how do you pray? They saw Jesus praying all the time. And so they wanted to have a clue. Well, what is this, you know, this communion with this relationship with God? Again, because going back here, if we have a quick, hurried, and cursory type of prayer life, then we, that's, that's basically shows what our relationship with God is. And so, you know, let's look at this. Would somebody um, start off with verse 5 and go through 13 in Matthew 6? Okay, thanks. And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the, your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, and they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask them. In this manner, therefore, pray. O Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. So let me ask the first thing. Going back to um, verse 8. It says, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So why pray? If God really knows what you need, what's the purpose in prayer? Obedience. I'm sorry, what? Respect, obedience. All right, respect, obedience. <clears throat> so that's something for Him to tell you what you need. Okay. It's said showing that you, you yeah. Okay. It's also professional. Okay. Professional things. You know, and, and, and I like, and I like, I mean, I, all these are right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, any of those. But I like it because when you really think about it, God already knows, and I'm a big advocate of, I mean, this this continues, and I, I keep saying this all the time because it obviously blows me away. God knew me before the world was, was born, was before the world was created. God knew me. So you think how, you know, whatever science you want to follow, uh, how many years the universe is, and how old the earth is, I don't care, I'm not going to argue on those points. But just think about it, before any of that was created, God knew each and every one of us. So then, if he knows all that, and knew me way back then, he also knows what I need. He also knows what I want to ask for. And so a lot of times, like as we said, praying to God is basically, and I love how, um, I think it's in, in um, 2 Corinthians, when we study 2 Corinthians, he, you know, Jesus is the yes to all of God's promises. And we, in Christ, are God's amen. You know what amen stands for? Amen and basically is, is yes. So, everything that was prophesied about Christ up to um, the resurrection was, was prophesied, and that was a yes to God. And there's still a yes to God coming forward. You know, the future prophecies of Christ that's going to happen at the end of the world. But all the prophecies were a yes to God. And because we are in Christ, we are an amen, a yes back to God. Because we believe in those prophecies. So in our prayer, it is that building of a relationship. And I love how it is because, again, he was teaching not to use this prayer as a repetitious type thing to say. Now, again, there's nothing wrong. I know that, I mean, a lot of times in, in, if you play sports and stuff like that, they say this before a game. Used to be in high school, we used to say this all the time, even at the stands at East Lincoln. 
we would say, and then all of a sudden, you know, that got nixed and and stuff like that with everything else that's going on. But, you know, I do know a lot of teams that still will sit down. They're, I'm not criticizing anybody reciting this prayer. But I think it's really important that we fully understand that it's not meant to be a, a prayer that's being recited. It's meant to be a prayer that's a model. So let's understand what the model's teaching us. So it starts off. And it says, when you pray, do this. Our Father who is in heaven. So what, what, are we, what are we learning right there? Yeah. But he's also a relationship. He's, we're calling him Father. I love how Paul, when we was, again, when we, was, when we was studying in Corinthians, he said, we can call God Abba. You know, Abba is in Greek? Yeah, Father. More, more than just Father, it's Daddy. I mean, how many times have you ever started off your prayer saying, hey, Dad? But that's, I mean, that's what, in a sense, that's the relationship that God wants to have with us. So we first start off with this prayer. And he says, hey, when you go to pray, let's start off just recognizing the relationship that we have with God. God, our Father, who's in heaven. Then it's, hallowed be thy name. What's the next thing that's doing? Holiness. Yeah, holiness or worship. You know, we're worshiping God. So we start off when first we recognize our relationship with God. And then, we, then the, next thing, the next thing we do is we just begin to worship who He is. Hallowed be thy name. Then continue on. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's He teaching us? To do. Okay, to humble ourselves. But humble ourselves how? Trust. Submissiveness. We recognize God's will. You know, I um been a tough week this week. There's um there's been a young girl that um she's out of high school and she's out of college now. Her name's Amber Parker, and she was a cheerleader at East Lincoln High School many years ago. And she um back in May she got um a real severe case of cancer in, in her ovaries area. And it was so severe, they were just, I mean, they basically didn't give her much time. They tried their very, she went through some major chemo and everything else, some stem cells. And eventually, through all the treatments in the air, her body just couldn't withstand the, withstand the treatments. And the cancer kept growing, and then she passed away this past weekend. And it's like, gosh, you know, you have to such a, wait a minute, God, how is that your will? For a young girl like that to die. And I can't answer that question. I can't go to that mom and dad and tell them. But one thing I do know, and when I pray, I say, I'm going to submit myself to God. Just think about Jesus. When he was getting ready to die on the cross, and he went to Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? One of the things he said in his prayer was what? It can pass, let it pass. Yeah. Not my will, but your will be done. Even Jesus said, hey, I'm going to be submissive to God, and so when we when we pray this, we're one, we're have building, we're building a relationship, we're worshiping who God is, and then we're submitting to God's will, whatever it may be. Because going back to what it says here, God already knows what we need. You know, I got I, um, I got a um, Facebook message from a um, guy. Now I, I get these a lot when you do a lot of traveling. Sometimes you get this, but I got this message from this um, guy down in Haiti. And, um, oh, Marty, will you be my father? And I'm going, okay. And I wrote back and I said, I'll be glad to be your advisor and be like a father to you, but are you asking for money? I said, because I'm not, I, I just don't do that. And especially, you know, I mean, there's people I do support when God opens those doors, but I just don't, every time someone says, hey, I need money or we need something like that, will you support me? And I go, no, I'm sorry, I won't do it that way. And stuff like that. But still, God, and I told him, I said, you got to learn to begin to trust in God. I don't know how many of you guys ever started from the ground up. But, I mean, in, in, you know, in my life, I started way down by. I was pushing brooms and everything else and, to get a job. I mean, I, I, want, I wanted to work. I needed to find a job. I just got married. And I didn't start off, you know, in a high-paying job. A lot of people nowadays, and a lot of these young guys I see coming into Duke Power, they're young, right out of college, and they're making, they're making more money than I ever dreamed of making at their age. And I'm going, gosh, you know, but still, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, 
all the way through my life. God has provided for every single thing in my life. Without a shadow of a doubt. He's provided for a job. He's provided for me to learn things in my job. He's provided, and, and, he, and, and more than that, he's provided for me to be able to continue to do ministry. Because a lot of times my job, my job at Dick Power was just basically the funds to take care of one of my family. But then also the duty ministry with, with student ministry and everything else. And it provided for every one of those things. So I'm going back, hey, God took care of those needs. Let's, let's continue on. Then he says, okay, so that will be done you know, as on earth as it is in heaven. Just think about it. God's will is always, I mean, it's, it's constantly happening in heaven. But God's will will be done also on earth all the time. This, you know, again, we get, I mean, we just went through this election thing and everything else. You know, people are, well, you know, how could Christians vote for so-and-so? Or how could Christians vote for so-and-so? You know, I get tired of hearing that. Yes, we have a right as a believer's to vote, as in, at least in our country. But, more importantly, we have a bigger right to share who God is. And realize that whoever it is that's going to be sitting in the offices of Congress, of the state, nation, or whatever, God's putting those positions. We can support them mainly, as, as, as constantly as we'll see in Peter, and as we've already read in, in, in Paul's letters, you know, to pray for them. Everyone, no matter what, the, um, re, um, election um, party they, they're for. We're supposed to pray for our leaders. So a lot of times, I, get, I do, I get sometimes I get frustrated because I see so much stuff on Facebook and people, you know, bad mouth and this and this and this and I'm going, and, and, and I'm going, well guys, let's slow down. Because a lot of people on my Facebook are, are, are believers. But so we have to sometimes say, hey guys, we need to back down from this and let's figure out ways to promote Jesus. Because God's, are, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it says here, it says, give us our daily bread. So after we sit there and we have a relationship with God, we worship with God, we, we submit to his will, then we begin to ask. There's nothing wrong with asking. Understand that God already knows what we need, but still a lot of times in asking, it's that submission, it's, it's you going back to God and saying, hey, God, I need this. I love it. And what, you know, I mean, one in, in, in Matthew... Um, Jesus tells a parable about a woman who wanted, who needed some um, bread and stuff like that. And she kept knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. And the guy wouldn't wake up. He went, I'm in bed. Leave me alone, woman. But he responded because she, con she continued. God, you know, in our, in our prayers, and it's not just one time you ask. It's constantly asking. It's, it's not nothing wrong with asking God. And we'll see this here pretty soon. We'll see. There's nothing wrong going boldly before God for needs that we have, even though He knows them. But that as we go boldly before God, we submit to His will. And we're recognizing His will in our prayers. Then it says this. It says, then forgive us our debts. So after we sit there and we ask, then you know, we also need to seek forgiveness. You know, Jesus said it also in Matthew. He says, hey, if you got something against somebody... Don't put your tithe on the offering plate until you go back to the brother and go hang get yourself, re re you know, restored. You know, forgiveness is a big piece in life. And when we begin to harbor unforgiveness in our lives, that can, that totally separates us of one from what God's desire is in our lives, but also separates us from the people around us where we can't be used by God because we're constantly holding this bitterness inside of us. That's right. And then he says, for, you know, um, and then do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What did we, what did we just got finished studying in Ephesians? Chapter 6. Yeah, the armor of God. You know, we went through that. That's powerful, because guess what? There is evil ones around us. So we need to ask God for that protection. We need to seek God in that protection. Not to go, as we talked in, in, in the Ephesians, not to go run the battle, but to stand firm with the armor of God and let God take care of the battle. Because the battle's already won in Him. And then I, how I love it, because we go through all this in asking, worshiping, building the relationship and everything else, asking for things, seeking forgiveness, um, asking for protection against things, and then it goes back, and I know in, in some translations, 
you don't have this verse because they, you know, when again, we, this is that discussion about Greek language and everything else, but there are certain manuscripts. And so, like, some Bibles won't have this last piece, but the King James and some, and some of the other Bibles do. And it says this, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so, to me, it's like a big circle. Because I first started off with a relationship and worshiping God. And then after I finished asking Him those things and, and, and asking for forgiveness and asking for protection, I come back to Him and I go back and I say, Hey, God, I still believe who you are. I give you the honor, the glory, and the credit for everything. And so it's that circle. So there's that model prayer. Again, it's and, and again, you know, I mean, I've heard, I've read stories, or read articles where people say, "Oh, you know, use use your hand and everything else." However, you want to do it. It doesn't mean that every prayer has to follow these little steps. Like, okay, the first thing I gotta do is I gotta have a relationship. The second thing I gotta do is have a, you know, no, it's not a step thing in type of prayer. But it's a model prayer to teach us how to go before God. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the prayers. Now, there's a, there's a lot of prayers in the Bible. And I encourage you, especially Psalms. You know, Psalms is, a, is, 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 you know, it is a psalm book in a sense. It's a lot of poems of Hebrew literature. But David, especially David, there's a lot of um, psalms that are just, and we'll look at one here in a little bit, that are just big prayers. And, I'll, I'm, I'm, and I'm a big fan of sometimes reading prayers of others and then writing those prayers out in my own words. And, we'll, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit later. But I want to just kind of look at some different prayers because I want you to think about that model prayer. And then I want you to look at how some people really did pray. And there's six of them that I want to kind of look at. And watch, help me watch one time, guy. An hour. The first thing I want to talk about is, is I, want to, I want to talk about Abraham. Now, Abraham, who knows who Abraham is? Go ahead. Anybody, go. Talk. Father of faith. Father of faith. Okay. What else about Abraham? Did, how did he become the father of faith? Was it quick? Yeah, no. I mean, he, you know, he called, he called Abraham, who at that time was Abram, to come outside the land of Ur, and which around the um, Babylonian area and stuff like that, and to come over to Israel, which was wasn't even Israel yet. And he says, I'm going to give you this land. Mm. And not only am I going to give you this land, you're going to be the father of many nations. Right. And he hadn't had a kid yet. And guess how old he was? You know, yeah, by the time he had a kid, he was 100 years old, but, it was, but he started off around about 70 years of age when he first went over. So there was 30 years of him constantly hearing God say, you're going to be the father of many nations. And he's going to... Uh huh. Yeah. When's this gonna happen? When, and, and anyway, <laughs> if, I, I challenge you. If you've never read Genesis, take spend one of your devotional time just reading through the book of Genesis. You'll love it. But ain't, but but still, this is in um, Genesis chapter eighteen. Um, so if we want to turn, because I would like for everybody to read through this. That's exactly where I'm at right now. Good. Genesis chapter eighteen, verses sixteen through thirty-three. And if somebody will find that, since you've already got, would you go ahead and read it for us, please? Good. 16 through 33. Genesis, um, 18, 16 through 33. Oh, that's taking it way back, Bo. Go ahead. Go ahead, dude. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham? What am I about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went, to, and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really <laughs> sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not judge 
of all the earth do right. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only one thirty, or only 30 can be found there? Mm. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Mm. And Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He says, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak mm. just once more. What if I can, what if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. All right. This is a powerful prayer. And this is this is Abraham just talking face to face with God. You know, so he, he just to kind of give you a little quick summary of where we're at. God showed up with two angels to Abraham's tent and told him, and you know, after 30 years he'd been telling him you had a son, and then he tells him, You're gonna have a son one year from now. You know, you know, and um, and Abraham's wife laughed and says, and he says, uh, "What are you laughing about?" And she goes, "Oh, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh because she was inside. You know, but God knew what was going on." And so he was getting ready to go down and judge Sodom and Gomorrah for the wickedness of what was going on. And so, but Abraham knew that his um, nephew Lot, who he had rescued, you know, you got again, you got to read Genesis. He had rescued um, Lot before, by, by, because um, Lot got captured by a bunch of kings. And so um, Abraham, he was a strong man. We're not talking. We're not talking about some little weak dude. And he had a good uh, many servants and people and stuff like that. He went and rescued his lot. Now you know Lot and Abraham have grown a lot and they got all kinds of cattle. And then finally they just got so much. And he's and so you know and he said we need to separate. And so Abraham, being the man who he was, he goes, you go ahead and pick the first place. And Lot looks down and he sees this valley and everything else. And we're talking, we're talking about the Dead Sea. So I'm thinking things have really changed. In all these years, but he looked down towards the Dead Sea areas and saw all this lush green land and everything else. He said, I'm going down there. So Abraham knowing probably hadn't been in communication, they don't have Facebook back then, they didn't have email and all this other stuff. But knowing that Lot was down there and knowing how Lot loved God, he had no idea what was going on, but he knew Lot was there and hoping that through Lot there was gonna be more people who were really serving after God. And so Lot, you know, Abraham goes and he goes, he starts off, hey God, you know, I understand what you're going to do, but how does he describe God? Did you, did you pick up on that? He calls him what? A righteous judge. A righteous judge. Have you ever thought about that? Even God in his, in his um, punishment, and the punishment for Sodom and Gomorrah was pretty powerful, you know. Basically, fire came down from heaven and wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. It's nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. You know, that's pretty powerful. That's like a nuclear blast from God. There was nothing to be left. But yet, God, Abraham recognized him as a righteous God. He created all this. And we can, when we begin to think about who God is, he is a righteous God. Yes, he's a God of love. And a lot of times we want to keep talking about the God of love, the God of grace, and everything else. But we've also got to recognize that, hey, God can't stand sin. He hates sin with a passion. He can't be connected to sin. And if it wasn't for the atonement of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't be in the relationship that we have without that. So, you know, you know, so he sits there and he calls him a righteous judge. Now, how, what else did you notice about this prayer? How bold was he? Crazy bold. Yeah. He was making a deal. Yeah. A master right there. You know, and then we go, okay, I mean, how, can, how do we go about praying? Can we pray with boldness to God? Yeah. 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 But we have, but notice in his boldness also was what? A reverence, humility. He's like, I'm sorry, hey man, you know, he's mm -hmm. easily in there. Doesn't prayer kind of check you? I mean, I, that's what I feel. Like the more I pray, it 
it's almost like I'm checking myself by having a conversation with God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I grew up, we're talking about with mantras, basically, you know, the Lord's Prayer and many other prayers in the Catholic Church. But when I started this, I had that question a long time ago about my praying right. Yeah. And the more you do it, you're like, wow. Yeah. I mean, at least that's the way I feel. So because it builds a relationship. It goes back to what, you know, what John Piper was saying. Hey, look, if all your prayer is just sitting here being quick and stuff like that, then your relationship with God is basically the same thing. You know? So when you really think about it, the more you pray, and it's not something that you get to be, you know, I mean, I've been a believer for a good many years, over yeah. 40, maybe 50 years. You know, but still, it's a constant growth. I will never tell you I've achieved anything. But I know that my faith in God has grown a lot over the years that I've got to know Him. And so as you said, the more we begin to pray, the more we begin to build that relationship where I really do can call Him Daddy. Where I really can do call Him Father and recognize who, that He loves me so much. Anything else, anything else about this prayer that somebody wants to share about? Because I don't want to lose time, but I want to, I want to move on because we've got a few, a few others to look at. Do you think He prayed... Just being real. Yeah. I think that's like something I I was taught I've been in church since I was born and there's a reverence in prayer that I was taught to uh, and you honor the Lord. You it's almost a fear. Like you can't say the wrong things when you're talking to the Lord. But what I found in my walk is that God just wants me to be real with him. If I need to cuss, he's pretty big enough to handle me cussing while I'm talking about mm -hmm. right. And he also says pray without ceasing. So if you're praying without ceasing, that means you're praying all day long. And how monotonous and boring would it be, our Father, I'm heaven? Wouldn't it be like, God, this really sucks right now. I really kind of need you to help me. That's right. Yep. It, it makes sense. Abraham was very real. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and he was very bold in this. I mean, you know, it's, it's and, and I agree with you. I mean, Fear, when, when you read in the Bible about the fear of the Lord, it's not to be uh, in a type of fray. It's it, Fear in, in the Hebrew actually means a reverence mm -hmm. to understand who you're going to. Mm -hmm. And you see that reverence here. Yes, he was 100% bold. He knew what he was wanting. He wanted to protect Lot. He really wanted to protect Lot. He didn't have an idea what Lot's ministry was in, 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 in the morning. And if, and if you continue to read, you'll find out it wasn't much. Because even after, he, I mean, it was just basic to his family. Mm -hmm. And even his daughters, once everything, you know, his wife turns to salt because she she did, she did disobeyed what the angel said. And she turned around and looked at it and she turned to a pillar of salt. And then if you continue to read the rest of the story, it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. they, get, they get Lot drunk to have kids. I'm going... Really? I mean, right. Hey, listen, right. the Bible's already. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there in the Bible. But, I mean, but still, Abraham had a desire to pray for others. And we're going to see this also about praying for others here in a little bit when we go to another prayer. But Abraham had a desire to protect his kinship. And so he was bold enough to pray about it. You know, hey, there's a lot of people, probably all of us, are praying for, hey, you know, because the person's got cancer or he's sick or, or whatever situation is going on in their lives. There's nothing wrong in praying that boldness. I have seen miracles happen. I've seen God heal. And we would pray for a healing and all of a sudden the next day or, or next week and Monday um, for this one little kid, he had this big old lump in his heart. And, you know, the family was just distraught. And then they go. We prayed that weekend, and then come, then come back Monday. She calls us all the the whole um, Sunday school class. At that time, it was one small group. It was called Sunday school. Class. She called the whole Sunday class because we all prayed as a group, and there was no lump, nothing, totally gone. They were looking at one X-ray. Here's a lump. They pulled an X-ray up, and there is no lump. I've seen God here. I've seen God stop rain because a whole group of students in a van was going to do a Bible study in, in a park in Vermont, um, up in Vermont. And it was pouring down rain, and, that, and our van was praying for God to stop the rain so we can so we can minister to those kids. We opened the door, and the and the rain literally stopped. Um, and we sat there, and we did uh, our vacation Bible school classes and everything else with those kids and stuff like that. We ate our lunch. We started to pack back up, and guess what happened? It poured down rain. But God stopped the rain, and I, I mean, I'm telling you, that's truth. You know, I've seen God do this, and the thing is, is, is I believe in miracles. 
-hmm. I believe God can do it. I don't believe that God's going to do a miracle every single day in my life. Because, again, it's His will, not my will. Mm -hmm. But I, can, I do believe in the power of prayer and being bold in prayer. I also believe that when we do pray and we see answers, that we ought to give God thanks. And that's the next prayer I want to look at. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Somebody get that and I want you to read, but let me give you a little bit of a history about this. This is about a lady named Hannah. Now Hannah was one of these ladies also that has been barren for a long time. And again, you have to understand in, 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 the, in the Jewish culture, to be barren and not bear children was in a sense somewhat of a disgrace to the husband. And so she kept praying, and, 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 and you know, her husband kept saying, don't worry, God's going to take care of things, God's going to take care of things. And she prayed, and, he, and when she was praying this one time, Eli, um, Eli was the priest, and he thought she was drunk, and she said, no, and she broke down to him, and says, you know, here's what's going to happen. God honored her prayer, and she ended up having a child, Samuel. And so when she has this child, and God answers prayer, I want you to read this prayer of thanksgiving. So whoever's got 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1-10, through 10, would you read that, please? Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiced in the Lord, and the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep taking. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out of food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who has barren has barren <coughs> has born seven children, but she who has had many sons pins uh, pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He, he, he seeks them with princes, 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 princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundation of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard his feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the end of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then and I went home to Ramah, mm -hmm. but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, what was, you know, as you read through this prayer, it was a prayer of thanksgiving. But again, how did she talk about God? Reverence and praise. Nobody but him. Yeah. No one holy like him. And how did she, how did she describe his will? He does what? He takes care of both the poor and the rich. He takes care of the needs. The hungry. You know, the hungry. The barren. So, you know, and, and, and I love this prayer because this is a prayer after she's already been bold enough to ask God for a child. Please, Lord. She's constantly been asking it. It wasn't just a one-time thing. she would constantly been asking for that. When God finally answered her prayer, she comes back. And, and a lot of times we pray things, and God will answer them. But how many times do we go back to God and give Him the praise and the glory for just answering those prayers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because why? Selfish humans, really. Right. Yeah. But, then some, but sometimes we use, and, and, and I think God, I think God answers a lot of our prayers, even sometimes when we think we're being selfish and asking Him. Just to show us who God is, 
But then he also wants us to have that reverence back returned to him. So like as we study about the Lord's Prayer, and we and we when we had that relationship and we worshiped him, we asked him for those different things, we came back around and we gave God back that glory. We worship God again for who he really is. And that's what Hannah was doing in this prayer. After everything's happened, she goes back and she honors God for answering the prayer that she'd been praying boldly for, for years. Part of this, too, that that last verse that he read, like God's granted her prayer and given her a son, but this is this is her, this prayer comes as praise when she's taking her son and going to leave him now. Like she held on to him just long enough to, to wean right. till he got to a certain age, and now they only went to see the priest for you know like a year almost kind of like thanksgiving and and did their um did their ritual um praises and offerings to the lord so she's now promised before if god would give her a son that that she would turn loose turn loose loose with him and and leave him with the priest to learn his way so she's doing that this prayer comes as part of getting what she asked for but then also giving it away and knowing she's not going to really see him but once a year when she goes back to the priest. And she goes back every year and she makes him clothes and stuff like that and brings those clothes to him. And the person that the person that was born here is Samuel. Right. And so, if you know, you know, again, I, I challenge you to read uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel because it's, it's just wonderful. But, I mean, you know, what happened is Eli and his two sons, they were just... I mean, Eli was the high priest, but he wasn't taking care of his sons. He wasn't providing discipline for his sons. And his sons were doing some really crazy things where God was bringing rebuke. And then basically he told Eli, hey, look, your family's not going to be in the priesthood anymore, period. Mm. You know, and I mean, you know, again, talking about the judgment of God. But he, but, you know, Hannah had no idea what that child would end up being. But Samuel ends up turning out to be one of the greatest prophets. And leaders in the church, or in, in, in the Jewish community at that time. You know, and again, I, I challenge you to read about Samuel and stuff like that. Alright, then I really loved it because, I mean, like I said, I, I read this, oh, probably Thursday or Friday from John Piper. And then we sat there and we, and we went to church. And if you went to church and listened to Taylor, it was just, to, to me, this is how I love God working, is because... God's been teaching me this, and, and, and again, this is teaching me, so I'm not an expert on prayer. I don't want anybody to think I am. But God's teaching me more about prayer, and he's telling me these things here. Hey, if you're satisfied with yourself, and you're satisfied with the world, then the less you're going to pray. You know, little prayer signifies a little desire from God. And I'm going, God, I don't want that ever be part of my life. And then we go to church, and Taylor teaches about prayer in Nehemiah. So I want you to turn to Nehemiah, because I think this is a powerful prayer in itself also. So turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to read, somebody will read uh, verses 4 through 11. I get it. <clears throat> when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant, the unfailing love of those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer, look down and see me, praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people rescued by your great power and strong hand are servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put into his heart to be kind to me. Alright. So again, think about this prayer. What was how did he go about praying? He was in the morning. He was in the morning. But he was also asking for what? Favor with the king. He was asking favor for the king. He was being bold in that. He was being specific. He was being specific. Specific about what? Why were the people, what what, what was happening? Where were the people at? In exile. Yeah, Mm -hmm. for what reasons? Sin. 
Yeah. So he sits there and, you know, I mean, you know, oh, you know, Jesus tells a parable about the um, the guy over there, the religious leader, and he's up there praying. And he goes, oh, Lord, and there's this, there's this religious leader and there's this um, beggar or, 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 you know, whatever you want to call him, just a man that's, you know, in dirty clothes and everything else. And this religious person can go, oh, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like him. And yet this other guy over here was going, God, you know, he's just beating his heart. He said, God, please forgive me. I know who I am. I know who I am. You know, so, you know, Nehemiah, I love this prayer because he goes and he's praying, but he's not sitting there like the Pharisee, like the Pharisee and going, oh, all these people, all my people, they've been so bad, God, but I've been pretty good, you know, and everything else. But look at all these other people. Please forgive them. What did he say? No, I've seen it. Yeah, not only them, Lord, but me and my family. Has also been simple to you, and so he's not only recognizing the sins of his nation, but he's also recognizing the sins of himself. And he's going, and he goes to God, and he says, and, and like I said, you can take each one first. You can almost turn, you know, turn into a Bible study on its own. So I'm kind of going through this pretty quickly. But I mean, he's he knows. He goes back to Scripture. He knows what Moses has taught. He knows that hey, if the people would repent. You know, going back, going back to, to Chronicles, where it says, if, if my people, you know that verse? If my people do what? Repent. Repent and turn from their ways. I will hear. I mean, it's one of those coffee cup prayers. But, it, but truly, that's the prayer of God. If we truly believe it. We have to come and repent. We have to come and be humble. So again, as we're talking about that model prayer, and one of the steps in that model prayer was forgiveness. We have to be honest with ourselves. A lot of times, prayer is building a relationship, but it's also just being honest with God and saying, hey, God, do you think God knows you've sinned? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Duh. Hey, God, you know, I really messed up here. Yeah, right. You know? But hey, when we go to God seeking repentance, when we go to God seeking forgiveness, we're humbling ourselves, we're submitting ourselves before a God who is just, but also loving, but who know who will smite us? You know, I mean, there's people where there's people in the Bible they didn't have much of a chance. You know, bam! You look at um, Ananias and Sapphira in the, in the book of Acts, and they saw how Barnabas was giving money away and everything else. They wanted that fame and fortune and everything else, but they only gave a portion and a lot about it. You know, and Peter walked up and said, "You know, hey, is this um, what God told you to give? I mean, is this all you got? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! We're, we're, we're looking at us, everything. Look what we're doing, and everything else." Uh, you're gone. Boom. You know, I mean, God's just. I'm glad God's not just like that with all of us. Or some of us, or man, most of us won't be standing, including myself, would not be standing here today. But yet, God is a God of judge. And He is God of justice. And He does smite folks. And He does take care of things. And sometimes we don't recognize that. But see, he's, you know, Nehemiah's sitting here and he's praying. He's recognizing who God is. And he's seeking God for forgiveness. Because he knows God's word. And he knows that, hey, if we go back to God, God is a God of love who will, re who will remove those sins and will continue to fall through. I'm going to ask my earphone, not mine, because I thought it might have been mine. And God will know, you know, and take care of that. And so this is, you know, again, I, I love this. And like I said, um, Taylor did a fantastic job going into this, and but it's powerful. And Taylor's whole point was, hey, we can't just be comfortable. We just we can't we can't be. I must be driving people out. We can't we can't we can't. I don't know, I'm kidding with him. We can't we can't just be comfortable in our seats. God wants us to have that relationship. God wants us to get out of our chairs. God wants us. And you think about it. How, how comfortable are you? Do you have that little desire for God? Because you're so satisfied with yourself. You know, and if you're satisfied with yourself and you're satisfied with the world, then hey, the less you will begin to pray. Nehemiah was not satisfied being um, bondage and with the Babylonians, even though he was in a good position. Right. You know, even though he had wealth and everything else, right. he heard what was going on in Jerusalem. And he knew that something needed to be done because he knew Jerusalem was God's holy city. Let's continue on. Again, what time is it? I'm good. I'm doing good. All right. The next prayer I want us to look at is a powerful one, and I'm going to read it because I I told you a little earlier. I'm a kind of person. A lot of times, I'll take prayers in the Bible, and I'll rewrite them 
in my own words. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to read my prayer based upon the scripture. And I want you to follow the scripture, but I want you to see how I rewrote it. And, I, and a lot of times in doing so, I'll use the message. And I don't know if you ever heard it. It's a, it's a paraphrased version of the Bible. It's not, you know, I'm going to be clear and honest. It's not a word for word Greek translation. But the, but the message sometimes just has a way of just using God's word and putting it into language that sometimes we can relate. And so I want you to turn to Psalm 139, because we're going to read the whole chapter. And I want you, I'm going to read it, but I'm going to read you, and again, this is not promoting me, this is not from saying, hey, look how godly Marty is or anything else. But I just want you to kind of see how I took the scripture and made it into my personal prayer. Three. Um, Psalm 139. We're going to go through all through the whole chapter. I'm going to give you some time to look it up. And again, I, I, I took the words out of the message and I even morphed it a little bit more just to turn it into a prayer for myself. And, I, and there's nothing wrong with this. But here's my prayer. And, and, I, and, I call, and this is a prayer a lot of times I'll go back to and, I just, and, and not to recite it but just to use it in my prayer as a guide, and, and just because I love how David, um, this, I mean, his, the prayer in itself is, is just powerful. But here's, and you can follow along in, in, in your scripture, and I'm going to read what I wrote down. Father God, scrutinize my life. You who sees all the facts firsthand, because I'm an open book to you, even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave, and you know when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to before I say the other the first word. I look behind me and wow, you're there. Then I try to get a glimpse of what's ahead and you are already there too. You are a reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, Lord? To be out of your sight. If I travel to a distant galaxy, you're there. If I go to the deepest underwater caverns, you're there. If I flew on an ultrasonic aircraft to the uttermost western horizon, you'll find me in an instant. Why? Because you're already there waiting. Then I say to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. Why? Because even shrouded in the darkness of night, and I'm immersed by your light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day and darkness and light, they're all the same to you. It just baffles me that you shake me first inside and then out. That you form me in my mother's womb. I thank you, God. Glorious Father, you're breathtaking. I am marvelously made, my body and my soul. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You knew me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how it was made, bit by bit, how I was sculptured and nothing was and from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watch me grow from conception to birth, a birth to all stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life were all prepared before I even lived one day. Your thoughts, oh, how rare, how beautiful, God. I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the grains of the sand of the sea. So let me rise in the morning, every morning, and live always to, with you. And please, God, do away with the wickedness for good. I see all those naysayers, all the people who belittle you, the, the folks that are infatuated with themselves with their cheap God imitations. I truly despise what they do because it displays a hatred towards you. I loathe in all the I, I loathe all the godless arrogance. I hate it with a pure under, uh, unadulterated hatred. I do not want to join or support this godless denial of, of you any more than just fa a fabrication of my imagination because you are God. My Lord, my Father, and my Savior. So I close the same request because I cannot do it on my own. Investigate my life, O oh Lord. Find out everything in me. 
cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of, about uh, get a clear picture of what about me. Show me my arrogance, my faults, so that you and I can deal with it. And then guide me on the road to eternal life. Amen. So I just took that prayer. Because that was a powerful prayer that David had prayed. And I just took that prayer and I want to make it my own. And so a lot of times when I'm just sitting in prayer time, I'll just pull this one thing back out and reread it. Again, it's not trying to be a repetitious thing, but it's just really recognizing and just sometimes just stopping and just, just like the South Park said, you know, hey, Lord, investigate me. You know me. You know me better than myself. You know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know the mistakes I'm going to make tomorrow. Even though you know it, Lord, you still love me. And that's what's truly, un, you know, just so powerful, God. So I challenge you a lot of times as you, you know, and, and, and the whole purpose of this it's really to get us to really start and pray more. And I don't know where you are. Maybe, you, maybe you're a prayer warrior. I don't know. I'm not. You know, I'm, I don't want to be the person that only prays a little. But sometimes I feel like I don't pray enough. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly just evaluating myself and saying, hey, God, look at me, where I stand. Um, the next prayer I want to go to. Um, is found in John, and I love, and, and I've talked about this prayer in Bible study in the past because this prayer is just, it, it's powerful because this is God praying for me. And I want you to turn to John chapter 17, verses 1 through 26. Now, to get, as you're turning this, just to give you an idea, Jesus is about to go to the cross. And so he's had the Last Supper, and he's praying this in front of his disciples. And not, this is not just a prayer for those 12 disciples, but this is a prayer for all of us. And so as we read this, I want you to listen to the words of this. And, and Does somebody have it? Mm -hmm. Can you read it for me? Um, Verses 1 through, um, 1 through 26. After, after Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to, to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Continue on. All the way down to verse 26. Okay, I have, I have revealed, I have, <coughs> I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They are yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given them comes from me, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with with certainty that I came from you, and I believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who have given me, who you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. The glory has come to me through through them. I will remain in the world no longer, and they will are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you have given me, that so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and I kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture will be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the, of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Uh, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who have who will believe in me through the, their message, that all of them may may be one. Father, just as you and I, you you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them to the glory and you gave that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have, have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the world, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they and they know that I, you have sent me. I have made I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that that I myself may be in them. Thank you. Um, and again, that's a lot of that's a lot of words. In but I want, but I challenge you to go back to this prayer because I mean it's a prayer that God has prayed. You know, He knows what's going to happen. So again, he glorifies God. He submits to God's will, knowing what's going to happen. I mean, you know, think about it. And sometimes, I think sometimes we take salvation too casually. But the salvation that we have cost. It was a death on a cross. And we're not talking about an easy death. We're talking about a death that lasted over six hours. You know, it's a painful death. And through that painful, because again, all the way through Scripture, and, and it's neat, you got to read through Old Testament through New Testament, but in, in, a short term, in a short version of this thing, you know, the removing of sin in the Old Testament was through what? Sacrifices, Sacrifices of animals. Okay? There was a high priest, you know, I mean, have we studied Hebrews? Yeah, we, did we study Hebrews? I can't remember if, if um, Cliff taught us Hebrews. But in, in Hebrews, Jesus is our high priest, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. And stuff like that. But that priest would stand there in front of the people. He had to be righteous himself. Because he was man, he had to come to himself. But as Paul writes you know, in his letter, he says, he knew no sin. But he became the righteous for all of us. Because of what he did on the cross. And so, you know, Jesus is here. And he's praying for his disciples. But he points, he keeps pointing out that, hey, not only do I want you to protect them, because I don't want you to remove them from the world, even though the world's going to hate them. But I want you to protect them from the world. And not only do I want you to protect these guys, but I want you to protect every person, that's you and me, who comes to know who I am because of their message. Because he knows what's going on. And so I sit there and I read this prayer, and a lot of times, sometimes when I just don't know what to pray at all, I just sit there and read what God prayed about me. And just take the time and just say, Hey God, thank you so much. Because you knew me before the world began. You knew that I'd be sitting in this very moment, sometimes not knowing what to say at all. But I just want to pray this prayer. And I thank you for this prayer that you spoke for me on my behalf. Along with everybody else who believes. Now last prayer. Any, any comments on this before I move on? I don't want to go too fast. What was that, that song, that last one? 149. The last prayer that we're going to look at is a prayer that we just got finished reading. This is out of the book of Ephesians. So I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and it's verses 14 through 21. And I'll read it, but I just want you to follow along. Paul's writing, um, if you remember in, in, in our study of Ephesians, the first three chapters have a lot to do with doctrine, about who we are in Christ, that we need to be seated in Christ. And before he talk, before he goes into chapter 4, talking about how we are to walk in God, and then in chapter um, six, 5 and 6, how we're supposed to stand in God, he sits there and he offers this prayer. And I love this prayer. I mean, because it's one of these prayers that's just not a prayer for himself or for those he's talking. He's praying for all of us. And listen to this prayer. He says, For this very reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ is surpassing knowledge, and that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to, to do far more abundantly beyond what we could ever ask or think, according to the powers that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And I sit there and I read that prayer. And I sit there and say, Lord, else? I, mean, I need to be praying for others also. That, hey, people will come to know who you are. And that you, no matter what I ask, you know it. And there's more things that you, you provide abundantly, more than I could ever dream of asking. He's there for us. And how can we actually know? There's something that um, John Piper wrote in, also in the same um, sermon that, he, that I had read. He says, closing with this, the more we desire the fullness of God, the more we desire to know the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, the more we desire to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit according to the riches of God's glory, the more we desire to know the hope of our calling and the riches of, of the glory of our inheritance, and the more we desire to be holy and pure, compassionate, patient, kind, tenderhearted, bold, and faithful. The more we pray, the more passionately we, we continue to pray. And so, you know, like, like I said, I mean, I didn't have the foggiest idea I was going to be teaching tonight. And I got called up at noon to do this. But God had already been teaching me this last week. And then when I heard um, what Taylor was preaching on, and then when, you know, when Cliff said, Marty, can you lead? I go, Okay, and the first thing it goes, well, let's go back to what I've been studying. And I think it's powerful because I, sometimes I just don't think we spend enough time in prayer. You know, and I'm not, and again, I'm not criticizing you if you pray in your car. There's nothing wrong with praying in your car and stuff like that. I mean, you need to pray continuously. But we really need, guys, as men of God, we need to have a good, quiet time with God. Whether it's in the morning, whether it's in the evening. A lot of times in my prayer life, I don't say anything at all. I just spend a lot of time reading His Word. I challenge you to go through His Word. And when you find a prayer, highlight it. Take it. Write it down. Because those are prayers that God's Word for us to be able to learn from. To see how God can, how we can be bold before God. How we can thank God when He answers our prayers. How we can really come before God like, like um, David did. And just, hey, God, here I am. Scrutinize me. You know, tell me where I'm wrong. I want to be open to it. To listen to how God pray for us. And then see how we should need to be praying for others. And to really recognize the, the unlimited power and love of God. Um, and I want to take this time just to close in prayer. And I don't want it to just be me praying. But I mean, I mean, like I said, I want you to be thinking. I don't know if you know this person or not, but her name is Amber Parker. Her mom and dad is Tom and Kelly Parker. Um, give you a little history. Kelly was in my youth group many, many, many years ago when we first got married. So I've been married for 38 years. So you know, I remember when Kelly when she, when she was in high school, and, and it, it breaks my heart that her daughter has passed away. I want you to keep them in prayer. I told you about a young girl that was suffering from a brain tumor, a rupture in her head, and God has answered that prayer. And she's now into rehab. And, you know, she had a little baby boy, and the baby boy is doing good. So God's been answering that prayer, and I thank God for that. And I thank you all for if you've been praying for that, and you continue to pray. But is there other needs that we need to be lifting up as a group? My mother in law had found cancer on her liver. It's fairly advanced. They still haven't done the first biopsy yet, but she's a 70 year old lady. 
couldn't hurt to throw one up for her. Mm-hmm. Still praying for my buddy's daughter who's two, almost three, and she's been fighting cancer and they've been doing stem cell stuff and talk about strong. That family whose uh, husband just passed away, uh, I guess I can call that. Yeah. I can't imagine what she's going through. Yeah. Well, I like to close in prayer, and what I like to do is um, I like to pray. Whoever wants to start, start. I'm not going to force anybody. You know, I'm not asking you to pray out loud on this. Some people don't like to pray out loud, and that's fine. I'm not, not criticizing that. But as a group of men, I would just like for us to pray. For those needs that you raise, I would like you to pray for those specifically, since you know those needs better than I do, and then the rest of this group. But then just, you know, anything else that God lays upon your heart, it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It can be a very short prayer. It can be just a sentence or so. And then I'll close this.